Paul Krugman. Not sure if you saw his recent tweet about uh, how calm the world was after 9-11, but Paul Krugman said, overall, Americans took 9-11 pretty calmly. Notably, there wasn't a mass outbreak of anti-Muslim sentiments and violence, which could all too easily have happened. And while G.W. Bush was a terrible president, to his credit, he tried to calm prejudice, not feed it. Daily behavior wasn't drastically affected. True, for a while, people were afraid to fly. My wife and I took a lovely trip to the U.S. Virgin Islands a couple of months later because airfares and hotel rooms were so cheap. But life returned to normal fairly fast. I couldn't resist having this great guest on. Let me just share the Jim Zogby tweet. Damn, Paul Krugman, the next day I received first of many death threats. We had police protection for weeks and three went to jail for these threats. I testified before U.S. CC our government about the murders, beatings, firings of Arabs, etc. We were in fear and it was real. Don't whitewash history. And without any further ado, the founder of the Arab American Institute. He is a um, a polling expert. He um, was a Bernie Sanders surrogate. And um, he did his best to try to save the Democratic Party from itself. Jim Zogby, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us again. Save the Democratic Party from itself. That was... <laughs> Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so how are you, by the way? I'm okay. Frankly, I, I was, I was stunned that Paul Krugman would write that. Um, there are some people that wouldn't stun me. I mean, if Donald Trump said something stupid like that, I'd say fine, but Krugman should know better. And, yeah. and, and it was not just wrong, but it was personally hurtful uh, because of what we had to endure in the days that followed. Uh, so for him to say that everything was fine, it really wasn't that bad, there really was no backlash to speak of, uh, is just grossly insensitive to the, the, I mean, look, the day of 9-11, they ordered my building evacuated, we're a block and a half from the White House. Um, I couldn't leave, and so we told the police we're not leaving because we were getting phone calls from people around the country. If You, you might not recall, but back when, um, the uh, Oklahoma City bombing occurred, um, we faced a terrible backlash uh, that had nothing to do with Arabs at all. This one we suspected might have to do with Arabs. And so the backlash, be and because the gravity of the deaths were going to be so great, uh, we, we knew that there would be, uh, there, there'd be a problem. And we were experiencing right off. By, by midday, I got the first of many death threats that I got. Um, for three weeks, we had police cars uh, up on the sidewalk in front of our building, uh, checking people coming in. We were under lockdown in the building. We couldn't leave because we were getting calls from all over the country from people saying, what do I do? We had to bring on um, a full-time person just to hear and process um, both employment discrimination, housing discrimination, um, uh, death threats and threats of violence we dealt with differently where they went right to law enforcement. Um, I spoke before the U.S. Civil Rights Commission one month in and presented a, a, a log of all of the hate crimes we experienced. That was only part of it. What happened was um, Bush did make comments about not, you know, targeting Arabs and Muslims. But while he was saying that, his uh, Justice Department was moving in exactly the opposite direction. Right. And so there was a daily, I, I don't know if you recall back then, there was a daily scroll on the bottom of the screen on the news networks with how many um, people had been arrested and how many people had been deported. And when the number got up to 1,500, they took it off the screen. It was in a couple of days they deported that many people. There was a mass roundup was what there was. And none of these people were guilty of anything other than the fact that they were here on visas and they were Arabs and Muslims. Um, that created incredible fear within the community, but it also enhanced the suspicion. In other words, the president saying it's not them, but we're, we're deporting them. So, I mean, people in my neighborhood would come to me and say, um, not thinking, right, that I was the Arab guy in the right. neighborhood, saying, um, these, you know, a couple months ago, these dark skinned people from, American University were looking for an, a, an apartment. Should I actually have called the police? And I, my wife and I had gone to stores and we would see, you know, Arab students in the store, um, kid in a baseball hat looked as, 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 you know, just could have been Italian or Greek, but right. 
um, he was being abused by people in the store. And then I also saw something else, which was after that happened a couple of times, some woman walked up to him and pulled him his sleeve and he turned to her like, you know, like didn't know what to expect. And she said, I'm so sorry people are doing this to you. So it brought out both. Right. But the fear was real. And um, and for Krugman either to not remember it or to whitewash it and or for him to say, um, and, you know, just don't forget, after a couple of months, the flights were released and my wife and I got a cheap flight to the islands. Uh, you know, look, uh, um, th when the dust finally settled, um, the biggest complaint we had was airport profiling. I right. mean, we, we had guys who were businessmen flying overseas who had a first class ticket and he was put in the back of the plane uh, with two marshals uh, and didn't get reimbursed. And we had people not allowed on planes. There was one episode that I'll never forget. A, a, a Secret Service agent, an Arab American Secret Service agent on the president's detail was flying from Washington down to uh, Texas to join the president's detail. He was off. You know, he had been off duty. He was going back. American Airlines wouldn't let him on the plane. Um, he showed them his gun. He showed them his badge. They wouldn't let him on the plane and then held him for three hours and then put him on a Delta flight, which was kind of weird because it's sort of like, we don't believe you're a Secret Service agent and your gun and your badge don't convince us, but maybe you are, but we're not going to fly you. So here, go to Delta. Uh, I mean, it was, it, but that kind of harassment took a real toll. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, it, it was real. It was real and it was a nightmare. And um, what kind of death threats did you face? Well, the first one was um, came that day, and I, I I had the wording wrong. I said raghead. He said Zogby, you towelhead. Um, I'll murder you and slit the throats of your children. Um, he followed it up with something else, a phone call. Um, it was actually the message was on a phone, phone call threat. Uh, FBI was able to track him down, uh, arrested him. Um, he pled that he was a decent family man and just was overcome by the trauma. Um, he used the Holocaust card, which really annoyed me that, you know, that he, his grandfather had been in the Holocaust, survived. But it's like that, it, it's, as I said to the judge, when the judge said, don't you feel mercy for him? I said, look, of course I do, but I feel more mercy for my kids. I mean, my daughter got a death threat at work. My son, my not my son, my other daughter, my baby daughter, who was a freshman in college, got one at her school. Um, and uh, it called her dorm room. Um, I, this was something that had to stop. And it's not, it wasn't new, right? I mean, I'd been getting death threats going back. The first one I got was in 1970, right? And um, um, and I'd let it go for years, almost like, I mean, I was on a White House panel on hate crimes in the Clinton administration. And I was listening to the woman speak and then the, the black guy speak and then the Latino woman speak. And what, and I'm like, oh wait, that happened to me. That happened to me that. And I, like, I thought I was there as an analyst, but what I really was, was a victim and I didn't know it. It was sort of like, you know, when a woman gets uh, sexually harassed um, for years and years and years, you just, th th I, I've heard stories of women say, well, you know, that just happened, right? And you just right. sort of, have to slap uh, it off. Right. What are you going to do? You go past the construction site and people make comments. Uh, that's how I did. And at, at some point, I just said, damn it, no more. You know, I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to let my kid, my eight year old daughter one time, well, when she was eight, um, picked up the phone and somebody said, your father's going to die. We're going to get him. And she started screaming and we said, what's wrong? What's wrong? She said, my stomach hurt. I, I have a stomach pain. We took her to the emergency room. We were there till three o'clock in the morning when she finally said, somebody said this to me. Um, and that shit just has to stop, you know? And so, yeah, I was really mad after 9-11. Mad because Arab guys murdered Americans who hosted them in the country and treated them well. They were fucking criminals, pardon my French, right? They were criminals who murdered innocent people. I wanted, like everybody else in America, to grieve with the rest of my country, right. but I had to keep looking over my shoulder 
because people pulled us away and said, you're not part of us. You're really part of them. And um, that that really made me upset. And I, I was, you know, I was actually, look, I've been a critic of the FBI for years and years, still am, practices they carry on. But they really did rise to the occasion. Three people, they sent three people to jail after 9-11 for threatening me. Um, and, uh, um, and the threats continue for others. I, I'm actually, I'm not as visible as I used to be. So um, I'm the old guy now, so I don't get it much anymore. But, you know, but, uh, but I know that, that folks in the community are still, when they're out there, there are people who are going to strike. And you were out there as the because you were the founder and head of the Arab American Institute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did your daughter tell you why she didn't want to say what had happened? I'm just curious. She was scared. She was scared she, that, like, by telling you, she was yeah. gonna. Well, she was eight, and I, yeah, you know, I, I can't penetrate the the thinking. Uh, she left here. She was visiting just a little, a little while ago. I mm. could have asked. Her. Yeah. You know, I, I just I remember she was really traumatized by yeah. it. Yeah. We all were. We all were when we found out. Yeah. My, my, the one freshman in college after 9-11 who got a death threat was uh, in her room. Um, she amazed me because um, she did not freak out. She got mad and she went to the dean and demanded a school forum on hate against Arabs and Muslims. Wow. And they did. They convened a thing and 600 people came. That's great. And it was like, my little baby did it, right? Yeah. And she was... I was so proud that she just rose to the occasion and said, no, this is not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She was pretty, pretty good. Wow. Um, yeah. I think people are, are not realized. Yeah. People, that's a good point that you made that, you know, Bush was saying one thing, but his justice department was doing another thing. And, and there was this, I was just saying with, with Sam that there was this, I remember hearing this idea of said, well, you know, maybe people are having their civil liberties violated but um if you didn't do anything wrong why would it matter like these yeah. illegal searches it doesn't matter because if you are innocent they're not going to find anything yeah <laughs> so, I, uh, yeah, uh, yeah ex except when the white guy gets pulled out for special screening at the airport right it, he just whacks it because yeah. whacks it it's white privilege don't pick on me but, yeah. Uh, but when it happens to you routinely, when you're when you're not allowed on a plane or when you're harassed before you get on a plane, embarrassed in front of everyone else, when you are forced to move your seat and and armed guards and it happened to me once in the in Charles de Gaulle Airport. I got there and um, there, it was during the the Clinton era when they did something equally stupid. Um, and um, I had to sit in the lounge with two armed guards standing around me. When you get on the plane after that, um, yes. it's like other passengers do not take friendly to you being sitting with them on the plane. And uh, yeah. no one wants to be humiliated. And you certainly don't want to be humiliated because of your ethnicity. Um, right. And so therein lies, the, therein lies the problem that people need to understand that, yeah, if you're a, a, you know, a black teenager walking down the street, uh, you don't have to be doing anything for somebody to shoot you. Right. If you're an Arab guy, I mean, we used to call it, uh, you know, flying while Arab. I mean, right. that's what it was. It was like, you know, we just happened to be at the airport and I happened to be dark skinned and whatever. Um, unacceptable, unacceptable behavior. And, uh, and people should not be subjected to that. Um, so, yeah. And look, yeah, I'll tell you, after 9 11, too. The other thing the Justice Department did was they did the the, the call ups. They they issued call ups for um, first was five thousand and then was three thousand. Just random Arab immigrants go into their local uh, immigration offices. Um, the problem was was that the system was so broken that many of the people who got the call up notices were citizens. Um, there also was a tremendous amount of harassment at the Canadian border. And because Detroit and Windsor, oh, yeah. Windsor is like a suburb, right? So people like, you know, it's like moving out to Long Island, right? right. People would, um, you know, if you, you start in, in, in Brooklyn and Queens, you go to Nassau and then you go to Suffolk. Right. Well, people start in Detroit and then they go out to Windsor and then they commute back and forth. A lot of Arabs quit their jobs because it was impossible getting across the border without humiliation and harassment. Um, and it was happening. It was happening routinely. 
Um, and it still happens, unfortunately, uh, but not in the same intent uh, with the same intensity that it did then.